Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Day, and I'm going to be the moderator for the forum uh, tonight. Um, as uh, I'm going to go through the agenda here briefly, and then I will be uh, um, going over some ground rules, and then we'll jump we'll jump right in. Uh, just as a uh, quick introduction on me, I'm a resident of uh, Berwick, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator tonight. Uh, thank you very much for everyone who's attending in person and hopefully uh, um, viewing online. Uh, I would ask that uh, anyone in the building here certainly turn off your cell phones or at least mute them uh, before we get going. Give you all a chance to do that. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, have our uh, timekeeper uh, introduce herself, if you wouldn't mind, and sure. we'll, we'll go over uh, the time cards that we'll be using. Okay. I'm Maureen Nikitas, and I am also a resident of Berwick. Happy to be here tonight. Nice thank to meet you. all of thank, you. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Um, if you could uh, hold up the two uh, time cards, yeah, we, uh, fl flip one. Thank you. <laughs> so the uh, 30, hopefully they're uh, self-explanatory, but 30 seconds, uh, that'll come up when you've got 30 seconds and you'll need to wrap up your comments. And then the time's up, hopefully you get that, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting over there. Uh, time is up. All right. Um, just, uh, um, well, let's, let's have a, uh, the, the Pledge of Allegiance, if you can all uh, rise and we'll... With the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is right over here in the corner. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, Berwick Community Media is hosting this event tonight. All candidates running for elective office in Senate District 34, House District 148, and the York County Sheriff's position were invited. Uh, all candidates uh, had previously confirmed their attendance. However, in the week leading up to the forum, uh, Republican candidates for elective office um, unfortunately declined to attend. In, in attendance tonight is uh, Joe Rafferty running for Senate District 34. Peg Wheeler running for House District 148, and uh, William King running for the York County Sheriff's seat. Thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. Um, all right, um, I'm just going to go through uh, the agenda here real quick. We'll do uh, opening statements. Uh, it'll be three minutes uh, each. There will be then there will be questions. There will be two minutes for each response. And uh, then, uh, if, if time permits, we'll uh, draw questions from uh, Basket. We have questions specific to uh, the sheriff's position and then to uh, the uh, Senate and House candidates. Then uh, we're, we'll stop around 6.50 p.m. to have time for closing statements. And um, we'll have two minutes for each closing statement. Ground rules. Uh, all participants will use neutral language to describe people and issues. All participants will refrain from personal attacks and focus on the issues at hand. Candidates will observe the time limits that we've mentioned. Uh, moderator, uh, myself, I'll ask the questions and uh, I will interrupt uh, if uh, you go over your uh, time limit within reason. Uh, I mentioned the three minutes for opening and two minutes for closing, and um, we will, uh, if when we get to the, the drawing questions, I'll just alternate uh, between the three of you. Okay. I think we are ready to get started. So, Peg, if you would like to provide your opening remarks. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you to all of you for coming tonight, and uh, thank you to BCM for hosting this event. Uh, my name is Peg Wheeler, Margaret Wheeler. 
I've lived in Berwick for about 40 years, and I think I know most of you. I have spent two years or two terms on the Board of Selectmen many years ago, uh, and then I subsequently spent 12 years as a school board director for MSA D60. Uh, my husband and I have raised three kids in the district and now three grandchildren in the district. Well, two of the youngest aren't here yet, but they will be shortly. Uh, during that time, I've served on uh, innumerable committees and boards. I was on uh, two different iterations of police advisory committees. I served as chairperson for the Heritage Day Festival way back then. That dates me a little bit. Uh, I was the president, vice president, secretary, I didn't do treasurer, for the PTAs and PTOs at the elementary schools and at the junior high schools. Um, I was most recently the president of the Boys Basketball Boosters Club. I was president of the recycling committee for many years until we sort of stopped because we uh, had services that were sort of providing those, those um, answers to the town and they didn't really need us anymore. Um, so I could, I could probably go on. I've done a number of different things for the town. It is a passion of mine. I do think that it's our responsibility, it's our duty to serve the towns that we live in. Um, when I was asked to do this, I was actually very honored. It is not a position that I ever thought I'd, I'd seek out, but I do think that um, I'm ready for it, having done some of the other things that I've done. I've done a good bit of door knocking, um, talked to a lot of people. I spent many years on other sides of the aisle, so to speak, and so I feel like I have friends in, in many places, and I like to listen to what people have to say and what they want me to do in positions like this. Uh, I think in both positions as a, a selectman in Berwick and on the school board, I, I found it to be my responsibility to do that, to listen to what people have to say and to take those, um, those values and those issues and those ideas uh, to the boards that, that I served on, and I still find that to be what I'd need to do. Um, the issues are different, they're bigger, and so as we go through questions tonight, I think that I'll be repeating to you quite often that I need to listen to people. I don't want to listen to voters, and I want to listen to veteran lawmakers. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Joe? Um, thank, um, thank you, and thank you folks for being here, both in the room as well as uh, in TV land, so to speak. Uh, my name is Joe Rafferty. I'm a candidate for state senate in uh, District 34, running for re-election, and I would um, hope for an opportunity to earn your vote. Um, I've been in Kennebunk, uh, a resident of Kennebunk, <clears throat> since moving to Maine in 1979. Uh, my wife and I got married in 1983. We have uh, three daughters. Um, I, am the, I am one of six children. Um, my mom's still alive. My dad has passed, uh, sadly. But, um, you know, my biggest motivation um, to be here, I think, has to do with all those different connections. Um, I am also uh, a retired teacher. I continue to coach at uh, Kenny Bunk High School. I'm a head football coach. And uh, I think that I personally, through those experiences, have gained a tremendous insight. I've had a daily connection with kids, and with kids you have a daily connection with their family. And you can see um, what affects them in both positive and negative ways. And uh, my experience in that area, I think, uh, has been invaluable to me as a, as a legislator. I had never envisioned myself of being a state senator or a uh, a candidate in any way, although as uh, I got further into my career, I, gradu I yeah, graduated, I retired in, in 2018, <clears throat> and right around that time, I was approached uh, by a, a local representative as well as some folks from up in Augusta, um, just because uh, th they had some insight in terms of my visibility, apparently, that I didn't, I, I didn't have, I guess. But in any case, um, be, it is because of those experiences with kids and their families. You know, I, I could see in, in my classroom, on the field, um, we're, you know, I'm, I'm always teaching, 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 but you learn a lot about people in terms of doing so. My whole career, I have uh, focused on teamwork, 
and preached and preached and preached that and cooperation in school. And I think that that has, again, been invaluable to me as a legislator. And it, uh, for me, I, I know that that experience has been uh, helpful for me to work with both sides of the aisle in terms of mediating and working through legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Bill? Well, hello. Thank you all for being here. You know, my mother used to say that um, time is our most precious commodity, and you folks are giving us your time, and it's very much appreciated. Um, you know, I'm Sheriff Bill King, and I'm seeking a third term as your sheriff. I began my law enforcement career at the Portland, Maine Police Department. I attained the rank of sergeant before leaving for an opportunity with the federal government with the Central Intelligence Agency. I later transferred to the Drug Enforcement Administration, then later transferred again to the Inspector General's office, where I finished out my 26-year federal career. I've had duty assignment in multiple states. After retiring from the feds, I returned to Maine, and I accepted a job as a criminal justice instructor at Central Maine Community College. A summer job at the York County Sheriff's Office was offered, and a permanent job was later offered as a patrol commander. In other words, I came here for a summer job, and I never left. <laughs> I was promoted to chief deputy and successfully ran for sheriff in 2014, and I was reelected in 2018. Our team has modernized and improved all aspects of the sheriff's office, and it's more aligned now with best practices. In patrol, we transitioned to sport utility vehicles with the light bars on the outside for greater visibility. We were one of the first, first police departments to go to the outer carry ballistic vests that are more ergonomically correct for deputies. We have unmarked cars for traffic control, a canine unit, and in-car video systems that have been installed in most cruises. But most importantly, we recently became the first sheriff's office in Maine to achieve state accreditation. This designation is only held by 13 other police departments and demonstrates our commitment to best practices in law enforcement. In the jail, we, pur in the jail, we purchased a body scanner that, would, that helps, to, um, helps our officers when looking for contraband. We've installed new camera systems throughout the facility for officer safety. We have the largest medicated assisted treatment program in the state for a county jail. Upon release, all residents are provided with harm reduction bags that connects them to services in the community. On our last state inspection, we received a 100% compliance in, on mandatory standards. In our civil, civil division, all of our uh, civil deputies are uniformed now. They all are um, uh, uh, law enforcement officers, and they provide um, assistance to uh, municipal law enforcement as they travel throughout the uh, county. In the last decade, there's been significant events that have shaped law enforcement and corrections. And to be effective in the office of sheriff, one must keep up with these changes and best practices. You cannot simply rely upon the way it used to be. Law enforcement management is a perishable skill. In addition to completing the annual law enforcement training that I've done every year to maintain my certification, I've taken numerous classes. I'm one of three people now in the state that is a, sorry, I have to smile. I want to get this last thing on it. I'm, I'm a certified jail manager. I'm one of three in the state uh, that have that, that distinction from the American Jail Association. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your opening remarks. Uh, we'll now uh, go into questions, and uh, what I'll do is I'll rotate just uh, between you as to uh, for, for each uh, question. Um, the first question uh, is uh, why are you running um, for representative or uh, Senate Sheriff's Office? Uh, I think you, you may have uh, hit that uh, already. I think everybody, I think, do you agree you've hit that question already? Well, Some, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, if you'd like to uh, address it again, that's fine. Uh, I would like to address okay, it again, go ahead, certainly. Sir. You know, this, this is an exciting time in York County, and it's an exciting time in law enforcement. Uh, at the uh, county, we're embarking upon some really innovative things. We've, we've got the, um, uh, a new facility. I'm on the committee to have a new um, uh, substance use um, facility that is going to be a 58-bed residential facility. We're going to have a detox. We're going to have short-term recovery, mid-term recovery, and long-term recovery. I'm on that committee, and we're shaping that. 
I'm also very involved with the new training center that we're getting at the, on, uh, on the jail compound. I'm sounding, if I sound quick and, and out of breath, is because I'm so excited about these projects. We're going to have a training facility for fire, for EMS, for first responders. We're going to have um, uh, just, it's going to be state of the art. And we're doing that with ARP money. And um, I'm on the cutting edge of that. I started that. Um, clearly, I mean, this, I, I, saw this, I saw these projects begin. We've got the uh, MAT. We've got so many new initiatives at the uh, Sheriff's Office and in the County of York. And that, I, frankly, I just don't want to give it up. I want to stay for another four years and see some of these through. Thank you. Uh, Joe, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, please, if I could. So, you know, why? Uh, it, it's mostly about, again, it goes back to people. I have a mom that's in a nursing home. Uh, I'm a retired e retiree working uh, and living on a fixed income. I have daughters uh, that have been educated here, lived here, and now live out of state. Um, and, and I talk to people every day. People call me fairly regularly and with real needs. And I think that uh, what got me into this was that's what I did as a, as a coach and a teacher. You know, you can kind of take care of daily things and you meet these kids and now all of a sudden here I am 40 some odd years later and these kids are as adult as I am. Um, some of them probably more. Um, but um, they still have needs. And I think that um, looking at that, uh, they need somebody that's caring and compassionate and that's willing to help. And uh, I, that's what I do. That's what I've done. And I think it's just we should practice um, doing the right things. And I think that it doesn't matter to me uh, who gets the credit, uh, or where that goes. It's just what is the outcome? And if the outcome improves somebody's life, I want to help do that. I want to be a part of that. And I want to have somebody walk away from a problem and saying, hey, they, they cared. They, they, they showed enough to care and they helped. And I think that that's, uh, that's what I want to be a part of. Thank you. Yeah, I think these two gentlemen have inspired me to want to add to my response on this issue as well. So uh, I, Bill King is right. I think this is a really exciting time. Obviously, for York County, I'm not aware of a lot of those things, but certainly in Berwick, we're experiencing some really exciting uh, new changes and growth that we've waited a really long time for. So for Berwick, it's a, a really great time. North Berwick always has exciting things on, on the table, and so I feel fortunate to be running, to be a, a representative for both towns. Um, I have adult children, so to, um, to Joe's point, I have adult children who went through this district and who have really kind of struggled to be able to afford to stay in this area. We're fortunate that they have, but it hasn't been without tremendous struggle. Housing is expensive, child care is expensive and relatively unavailable in the, uh, in the way it needs to be. So there are lots of issues like Joe. I, I also am an educator. I've worked in veterinary medicine in this area for 40 years, so I have met with families and people on that level and have sort of had the same experience. I've met with them on one level and they come to you on another for support. Also having been a board member, people still do contact me for issues. And I'm hearing the same story, knocking on doors from lots of families who have children that have been through the district who they'd like to have be able to stay here and they can't. So um, those issues are issues that I'd like to have an opportunity to, to work on. Uh, but I do think that, to Bill's point, I think it's a really exciting time in this area, and it would be an honor to be able to represent the town. Thank you. Okay, next question, and uh, I'll uh, start with Joe, please, on this. What do you see as the primary work uh, for the, uh, the Senate? Well, I, I think that it's being there for the people of Maine, and that comes in many shapes and forms. Uh, that We have 13 committees. So we kind of, uh, in, each, in each committee, we have um, 12 to 13, uh, 13 members. And so though they, a problem comes to them or, you know, looking at bills, but day to day, the 35 of us, we hear from a lot of folks and we just need to be there to answer. I, I have shared, probably you all have it, maybe if you have anything about me, you have my cell phone number. If you dial it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the guy that answers the phone unless I'm out in the yard and my wife does for me. But, I mean, I think it's important for us 
to be there for you, to be available, um, so that um, we can help. And I, you know, for me, it's it's all about answering that call. And I don't have all the answers, but what I do have is an ability to tap into the resources and find them the resources that can help them through their their struggle at that piece of uh, at that moment in time. So, um, I I'd say that more than anything, it's that that caring piece I mentioned earlier, and just being there when people need. We all go through those moments. We all have experienced a need, and uh, being there for somebody I think is what the Senate tours or any legislator needs to be. People put us there for a reason. We're there for them. Thank you. Bill? For the... Uh, what was the... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what do you see as the primary work of the sheriff? Well, the primary work for the York County Sheriff's Office is, remember, there's 29 towns and cities, and um, we take care of 14 of those towns with policing services. They don't have a police department. So I think my primary focus right now is going to be is to continue in reducing the part one crimes in our communities. And frankly, when I first came, we've done an effect, a very effective job. Um, but we need to continue with that. When I say part one crimes, I'm talking about the serious crimes, the burglaries, rapes, the robberies, that, that type of thing. So we'll continue on that. The second priority for me is the opioid epidemic. It hasn't gone away. And you know, with COVID, I think we all sort of turned a blind eye to it, you know, because we had more important things to do. The third, the third um, priority that I have is the traffic control in our, in our areas. And it's so much so that I started an initiative during COVID that I, when I was walking, when I walked through the jail, I would see my receptionist sitting there and the lobby was closed, everything was done, and she didn't have anyone to receive. And finally, after the 19th time, she said, do you have anything for me? I said, you know something? What I keep hearing is that there's a traffic problem and the deputy would be out of position. Remember this, you know, 300 miles. I mean, we, we cover 14 towns. The state police certainly assist us with that. But we just never seem to caught, catch up with those people that are speeding or running somebody off the road or something like that. So we started a program in which I was writing to the people. If someone said, gee, this vehicle was speeding and almost hit me, this is the plate number. I would write to the registered owner, non-accusatory. I would say, look, your vehicle was reported doing this. And the response has been awesome. People would call, it's my son or my daughter had that vehicle. I also write to the people, to the community members that called us, to, that called us, and they, um, uh, I would thank them for their citizenship. I was asked yesterday to speak at the um, New England um, Highway Safety Coalition. They had a conference, and I've already received two emails saying we want to replicate that in New Hampshire. So I think that that is sort of an initiative that I want to continue also, but I also see that as, as a priority. We have to slow people down on our roads. Thank you. Peg? Yeah, so I guess in, in the, I'm not there yet, so it's hard to, for me to say what are the biggest issues that they've been dealing with, but I think it's safe to say that um, we have uh, housing issues to deal with, we have energy cost issues to deal with, we have um, folks who are really struggling, planning on how they're going to get through the winter. We have um, fortunately been able to fully fund education at the 55% we've all been wishing for for years, but we need to make sure it stays there. Uh, I think that's a super important thing to keep on the horizon. I fear if we look away, that might go away during economically challenging times. Um, but I, I agree with Joe. I think we need to listen to people, and, th and that is fully my intent, to listen to people and hear. I've heard some really interesting things out knocking on doors. I do hear a lot about traffic issues. I hear a lot about people speeding on my street, and uh, I'm going to start saving some, some plate numbers. Uh, I'll write them a letter. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I, I, I think the same issues that affect us nationally, we have to watch for the state as well. Uh, and I hope we can do that in the bipartisan way that Maine sort of has a history of doing. But I, I think looking out for voting rights, looking out for 
um, women's rights, those are things, and diversity in this state. We need to look at other ways to uh, bring workers into Maine and to keep them here, and that involves looking at some diversity and issues, uh, issues as well. I'm all set. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next question, um, and uh, Peg, we'll start with you on this one. What do you feel are the most important challenges facing the state of Maine? And I think you're going to... Yeah, I, you, you, I think I, you hit them, but bringing workers, bringing workers in. I think right now a lot of companies, we see so many companies that are struggling to find enough work to keep their um, businesses running and open the hours that we'd all like to see them. So uh, I think that that's a, a, a real upfront problem. But yeah, I've already addressed some of the other ones that I think are, are big: housing, energy, um, keeping our kids here as part of our families and our workforce. Um, looking at ways to support teachers and educators. Uh, we have an awful lot of teachers leaving the field and that scares the daylights out of me. So looking at ways to um, support them in the work that they're doing uh, and child care, providing child care for families so that we can have two people going to work if they choose to do that. So one of the things I didn't say, which, uh, um, uh, and my apologies, if you have any suggestions on how to um, address those, and, and I would give you a little more time since I didn't say that right up front. Front. How to address them. So those are things I'm going to have to work with veteran lawmakers to establish. I don't want to sound like I have the answers, but I do think um, there are opportunities to work with the experts in those areas, like the sheriff's office, so uh, for opioid issues, which mm -hmm. I agree. I think that did sort of fall off the map. We have some local people who are very active in those areas and have been working very hard, and I think those people locally can provide ideas for what they'd like to see done. Housing, same thing. We have housing um, authorities that we can work with to find what we can do. Berwick has been really kind of proactive at providing low-income housing opportunities, uh, but you know, we, we need to make sure that we uh, have the resources from the state that we need to support those people. So yeah, I think I'll need to listen, do some listening for the first, first year. Okay, thank you. Um, and Joe, just again, the question was, what do you feel are the most important challenges facing the state of Maine, your county, or Berwick, and how do you propose to um, address them? Um, as, as Peg mentioned, there, there are numerous, and I would, I would say that currently, you know, this, this past summer, I was fortunate enough to accompany the governor uh, on a number of stops throughout York County and many of those right in Berwick and in, in, in this area, and including Hussey Manufacturing and Pratt and & Whitney. And walking in the door, the governor, she would like instantly want to get right down to business saying, how can I help you? And the first thing out of everyone's mouth in those facilities was, we need workers. And um, so we have to look at ways where we can attract workers. Um, and both of those companies have significant uh, packages in terms of health care and, and pay. The problem is then it turns into a housing issue. So affordable housing means a lot of different things to different people. When I look at my daughters, can they buy a house? When I look at some of the elderly, I talk to some of the elderly I talk to over the weekend, it's like, can they afford to stay in the house? Um, so they mean different things. If you're out looking for an apartment and you don't have first month's rent, uh, security deposit, and last month's rent up front, you know, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an issue. So those things, we have to collectively find ways. I think that there are home ownership programs. There's a lot of, um, you see in some communities where they're taking old school buildings and restructuring those into multi-living living, uh, senior homes. So that's the type of thing. We just have to be creative, but I think it's creative and collectively uh, and again, I go back to let's not worry about who's getting credit. Let's just solve the problem. Bill? Well, the biggest challenge facing York County at present is the, um, the vacancy rate at the jail. I think the vacancy rate right now is like 38 officers, which is really causing a lot of people to work extra. Um, we've done a couple of things. Um, such as we've got a, a little room in our gym so that if an officer works a couple of doubles and he's tired and doesn't feel that they can walk, uh, drive home safely, they can go to the gym and they can sleep for the night and everything is included. There's a shower and there's towels and all that type of thing. So that's what we try to do that. We try to do a lot of employee engagement things. But really, 
<clears throat> and the short-term solution is, is that we're paying with incentives 26.30 an hour, which is a very good salary. Um, we haven't reduced, uh, you know, any of our, um, our standards, so we're really out going to every job fair. We've got ads in the movies. We've got signs out. We've done everything that we can do. But we also have some long-range plans that I think is probably is going to be the answer for that, and that is the asylum seekers and the refugees that we have. I went to a few months ago, I went down to uh, the Comfort Inn in Saco. There were school buses lined up. I went in and started engaging with some of these, uh, some of the asylum seekers. They want to work, but they have to wait six months for the work permit. So I, I, I contacted Charlie Pingree's office. I, I contacted Senator King, Senator Collins, saying, and there is some legislation, legislation that Senator Collins and uh, Representative Pingree has proposed to reduce that time from six months to a month. But now the legislature has adjourned. It's not going to be till next ne next year. But I, I actually and tried to. We did a workaround. We went to um, uh, some York County leaders went to a. Um, training session with that pretty Flaherty put on and we talked to some immigrate I talked to an immigration attorney and of course there was a lot a lot of crowd there but I emailed her just this this morning and I asked her I said does I realize that they can't work but can they go to training so we're trying to work through that workaround right now so that if an asylum seeker wants to work and we deem him qualified let's put him into the training process for, to be a York County Corrections Officer, we have to work out the compensation piece, but perhaps when they get done the training process, then they get their work permit and we'll have a, we'll have a worker. So we're working very, very hard, and, by, and this is a national problem. This is not isolated to York County. Thank you. Okay, the next question uh, is uh, what differentiates you from the other candidates, and we'll start with Joe. Um, I, I think that my experience in terms of, uh, I'm, I'm running for re-election, so I, I have two years under my belt. I would say that I, I am not your typical politician. I am a person uh, that, that is interested in helping people, but I think that um, in, in, in terms of uh, moving forward, I think the most important thing is just understanding. I've been available, I'm accessible, um, I am visible, and I am willing. I, I think that I, uh, I, my days are long, um, and they're every day. It's not occasionally, it's every day. So uh, I am there for you. I feel like you put me where I am. I'm answerable to you. In order for me to repeat and have another two years, I have had to have proven to you that I'm willing and able to do the job, and that I've done the job. Um, and I think time will tell us that in November. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, Bill, I have you up next, please. Yes, certainly. Well, I think that my contemporary experience, I mentioned that a few, a few things in my opening statement, but law enforcement is a perishable skill. You have to stay current. I mean, look at what's happened in the last decade. You know, Trevon Martin, um, George Floyd. I mean, bias-based policing. I mean, we've really, really progressed. We had to redo all of our policies at the sheriff's office that include policies on the homeless, how to handle the homeless, how to handle um, uh, bias-based policing. So it's, it's really a matter of contemporary experience and also, I think, desire. I mean, I've kept up on all of my trainings which my opponent has not, um, and I've not only kept up on the mandatory trainings, but I think I mentioned that I'm now a, a, a um, certified jail manager. I also got my executive certification from the Maine Criminal Justice Academy. A couple months ago, I went to advanced training for jail administration at the FBI Academy. Um, and I feel that that's, this is not the time for on-the-job training. This is a time, and it really is a lot of things are happening. This is some very, very serious issues that we're facing, and I think you need that experience, and you need the education that I have to, um, to continue keeping the sheriff's office in an upward trajectory. And we have a very strong 
leadership team at York County, um, not only just at the Sheriff's Office, but in the whole county. And I really enjoy being part of that team. And I think that we'll, um, we're going to see a lot of great things. So I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Thank you. Peg? Uh, I think probably what differentiates uh, my, my situation is the experience that I have had uh, on many different boards and committees uh, for the town and for the district. Um, and th that is significantly different than my candidate. So I've served the people of Berwick and North Berwick uh, for many, many years. Uh, so I have developed those relationships. I think I've developed a good bit of trust with a lot of people in Berwick. Uh, and now that I have kids living in the district, that gives me, uh, one is a homeowner, um, they work in the town, they work in the area. Uh, so I think that gives me a, a, an, a, an even deeper connection. And I have grandchildren who are going to be here, so I have motivation to, um, to keep those connections with people and to help the towns and the state move forward. Thank you. Okay, um, what we'll do now is um, I'm going to uh, take uh, questions from the, uh, the box and uh, or boxes. <coughs> and um, I, what I'll do is I'll draw a question depending on, uh, you know, either the sheriff's box or, or the uh, Senate or, Senate or uh, uh, House box. And um, but, uh, I'll start with uh, um, Bill, if you don't mind. Certainly. So the first question is, how are you or will you work to show our county that mental health is just as important, if not more important, than a criminal's actions? Oh, that's a, that's a very, very good, good question. Um, we do have, I think that off with, um, with a substance use disorder, there's often co-occurring mental disorders that the individual also has. So we have been doing that. But typically when we have someone come in and they're, when they're assessed, if we do determine that they have some mental, uh, men mental illness issues, that we have a, um, have a medical unit that assesses them, and then we try fervently to get them into the, uh, um, the stabilization unit at the prison, just to, to stabilize them. Um, we've had issues, uh, you know, I, I can go on and on and on with example after example, but that's one of my priorities, is that it's, there's people in jail that exceed my comfort level, frankly, that they don't belong in jail, they belong in a, uh, in a, a, a mental health uh, <coughs> facility. Um, so. It's been one of my, there's, unfortunately, there's no place to, to send these folks. So what we, we try very, very hard to, um, uh, to work with the state and to place them, but in, whether it's Dorothy Dix or whether it's at the uh, uh, stabilization unit at the prison, we're, we're just trying to get them there. Thank you. And, and for, that, for that person that sent, that sent the question, she's absolute, that person is absolutely right. It is a huge priority. And it's an issue. Thank you. Okay, the next question uh, is, um, and I'd ask both of you to uh, respond to this, and Peg, you can start first. Do you support the CMP corridor? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, have, I have concerns about the CMP corridor. I have concerns about the land in Maine that it's going to destroy. Uh, and how that uh, energy travels straight through us to provide services to Massachusetts, but not really to the state of Maine, while it's sort of destroying our resources. Uh, so I have some learning to do on this subject. It's a subject that's sort of a bit bigger than the experience that I've had locally dealing with um, issues, but I do have some tremendous concerns about it. I, before I would support anything like that, I would want some answers about how those things are being mitigated. Thank you. Joe? Uh, in the end, no. Uh, I, you know, when I looked early, um, it was very confusing. I think both sides did a great job of continuing the confusion. And, uh, but I, when I really looked close at it, the, the communities that bordered uh, the, the northern border, that that was that clear cutting and so forth was going to take place, um, all voted against it. They were all against it. Those communities didn't want it. 
and I felt like it was, you know, uh, a situation where some of us that were had ultimately very little effect on us were willing to kind of sacrifice them because, you know, it's not in our backyard. But uh, the reality was, I in the end, I did not believe that the jobs were going to be ongoing. Uh, those were all temporary jobs, and I think that um, the benefit was to um, people outside of our state, and I felt like that we were sacrificing some of our own natural resources, risking some of the potential impacts on our natural resources, and ultimately I didn't think that it made sense for me. Thank you. The uh, next question is, and, and uh, Peg, if you could start off on this. Do you support the investigation of alternate power sources more in line with reversing climate change, such as wind, solar, and other? Absolutely. Yes, I'm a firm believer that climate change is an issue that we need to address, and we need to address it swiftly if we have any hope of uh, providing some mitigation that will serve our children and our grandchildren. So yeah, I think as much investigation and implementation as we can possibly do uh, is, is where we need to be. Thank you. Um, in the interest of, I guess, staying on that, uh, Joe, could you uh, respond as well? Um, sure. I, 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 I think that, you know, if you drive down the street, this house is heating with wood, this one's got electric, this one's got oil. And I think that's always going to be, I, I don't think there's one answer, there's not one method that fits all. So I think we do have to continue investigating. I think that we have to consider the environment. I know that that's, uh, you know, I, I scored big in terms of the Maine's conservation voters scorecard. But I mean, I, I just think that we have to be conscious that um, what impacts they have, but certainly have to continue to explore. The, you know, we, we learn more every day, and there's great science ahead of us, and I think that we're going to solve the problem, but I, I don't ever see that there's going to be one solution or one, one answer. We're going to have multiple forms of energy, I, at least in my lifetime, um, but you know, down the road, I, I, you know, it's hard to tell, but I, I think that we just got to keep looking, and I think we have to work together because um, I, the reality is we've had a a negative impact in terms of the environment, but I think that we um, we also need energy, and so it's uh, we're going to continue to consume it. We just have to find the right path. Thank you, Bill. Bill, next question for you, um, and I think you had, uh, touched on this already, but it's no secret there is a major major shortage of staff at the jail. What are your plans to turn that around? And if it can't be turned around, what are your plans to alleviate the pressure of the current corrections officers suffering burnout and work fatigue? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to add on to what you already said on that. Well, well actually, we, we, we did um, um, meet with Cumberland County, and we did a, uh, a resident exchange so that we can have more like-kinded, we, we cohorted residents so that that would we could have more people in one unit still within the guidelines. Like, for example, all of our female residents are now housed at Cumberland County, and we have more general population residents. It just helps us. And actually, it, it helps us a lot because if they have, they send us their, their um, residents that are on medicated, that are in the MAT unit, medicated assisted treatment, which just, it gives us an opportunity to use our largest unit for MAT. So and again, we can have have the MAT in that unit. Everybody's cohorted together. Everybody has the um, uh, the counseling together, and they sort of sort of uh, like it's almost like a therapeutic community. They sort of all talk to each other to try to keep them explain what you know what they what their hopes and visions are when they get out. It also helps us with religious services that if they're all cohorted, because when you had the females and you had uh, special management, it, it was a little more difficult. So now we can have basically one service. Thank you. That didn't really answer your question. I apologize, but it, but and 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 we are and we're still working on the on the recruitment and and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Next question, and, and Joe, if you could uh, 
start us with this one. Maine has a significant opioid and or mental health issues um, within the county jails. As a uh, senator or representative, what do you believe needs to be done to address these issues? Oh, I think, you know, the opi opioid issue is significant and mental health. I mean, you heard the sheriff mention that as well. And they are, they're real. They're in everyday society. And some of us are, are touched regularly by them. But I, I know that um, we do have some programs that, that I think we have to be creative, but currently there is a, uh, a program in the jails. It's a medically assisted treatment program, and it, it is being piloted in Maine. I believe it's present in uh, three jails, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think it's the women's jail in Wyndham, the men's in Wyndham in upstate. I can't think of that. Mm -hmm. Bold up. What is it? Bold up. Bold up. So, um, but those programs, uh, again, um, and what we're finding and is the results based on other states like Rhode Island and Connecticut, Massachusetts, that the person coming out that have been through those programs are less likely to be repeat offenders. And they recover from their addictions at a rate higher than, than, than what's happening in everyday society. So it's a controlled environment, but um, we, you know, the opioid crisis is real. And again, I, I've had former students, former players that, you know, this, all of a sudden you read in the paper, died suddenly, and then I find out later, this is why. And so it's, and again, it's touching us all. We have to, it's, it, I mean, it's a real issue and we have to step up and face it. But I think that um, that's one way of doing it. And, and again, just, um, you know, looking and looking around the country at different programs that are working and copy them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I coincidentally serve on the board of directors for an organization, the Maine State Society for Protection of Animals, that is across the street from the women's mm -hmm. prison in Wyndham and have um, had the opportunity there to see what the programs for those women to get out and work in the community in addition mm -hmm. to the other programs at the jail have done for those women. So uh, I think conversations like this with people who are experts at this and have significant experience with the MAT program, as well as other programs in the jails that seem to help people um, heal uh, are what I'm going to need to learn more about. But I also think that it starts before that and we need to support our schools um, and families that are dealing with these issues and trying to pro provide some preventative support, as well as the organizations in our community. And we have some locally that are really working hard to support people who are struggling as well before they end up in the in the system. Thank you. Uh, Bill, in the past year, there have been several COVID related issues at the jail. What practices have you or do you plan to put in place for the safety of the inmates and the staff? Yeah. Well, there have been some COVID related issues at the jail and um, We've, uh, we've taken them head on. We, we were the first jail to have an outbreak. And since then, there's been 47 other outbreaks in other correctional facilities. Um, we've, we've really become the model for it because we've, we've, we've have a, a plan and the state came down and inspected us. And actually they've adopted some of our, uh, some of our uh, strategies. We still have, um, before, uh, people come to work. There's signs. If you're not feeling good, turn around and go back. And also, we still take their temperature, and we still do uh, periodic health screenings on people. So we've really kind of tackled that. Uh, I, I now, if we have an outbreak in next week, you know, I mean, you know, because you just never know. But um, we're very, very cognizant of it. We've now, and we're starting to start training people and educating people on monkeypox. So we're really in tune with that. And, um, um, yeah, I was just, I was going to go into, you know, what we're doing with, with monkeypox, but um, it, um, you know, we have these conversations constantly, and everybody is aware of that. Thank you. All right, we'll do uh, the final questions for uh, Joe and Peg. Um, Peg, if you could uh, respond to this first. Will you support legislation to allow retired teachers to collect their social security benefits? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I, I can't equivocate Kate, on that. Yeah, absolutely. Having served on the school board for as many years as I did, this is an issue and we need to fix it. So, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Joe? I'm a retired teacher. <laughs> 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 and I did contribute uh, to both uh, my own you know, state retirement as well as the uh, federal program. So, um, yes, I would. And I will say that Maine is one of only nine states across the country that doesn't allow for it because people call it double dipping. Um, they didn't call it double contributing, but they call it double dipping. Um, but in any case, I, I would. And I was... I spearheaded actually this past year the efforts to um, increase the amount of money that retirees, so the, your retirement plan now is going to allow you 25000 the first $25,000 of the money you earn from your retirement plan is no longer taxable under Maine um, tax laws and it's going to increase $5,000 next year and then additional $5,000 after that until it hits the $35,000 mark, which will kind of match the federal plan. But absolutely, I, I don't believe that it's ever going to happen, to be honest with you, because the vote and support for it has to come from outside of Maine. I think uh, the New England states um, are in favor of it, but there's not a lot of support for it outside of this, uh, this area. But fully supported, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, as I had said uh, originally, um, I would uh, stop us around uh, 650, which we're, we're about there, um, and a lot of time for closing remarks. Do you want? I was just going to say reverse. Okay, we'll we'll do uh, the uh, reverse uh, order for uh, closing remarks. So uh, that'll be Bill, Joe, and Peg. Bill, if you'd like well, to. Well, thank you very much. If, if I if I could, I just wanted to kind of address that teacher comment during my closing remarks and only take a minute because I came back to uh, Maine and I was a teacher at uh, Central Maine Community College. And I left there to go to, to, be the, to work at the sheriff's office. And my friends told me, why would you do that? Why, you, why would you take leave being a teacher, you know, to go run, you know, a large police department a jail and a civil process and have to worry about a $15 million budget. I told them I couldn't take the stress of being a teacher. <laughs> so I, you know, it, it, it's an honor really to be here today and, and to engage with you all and um, in the community live and in real time by providing these answers through this forum and in person. And I just hope the audience recognizes and, and the TV viewers recognize the authenticity and the sincerity of all of our responses. You know, and it's no secret that there's only three people from one party at this forum. You know, in any response from any other candidates submitted in the future, remember, they have the benefit of hindsight, time, and research. So you heard it from us, very, very authentic, very, very sincere, off the cuff, this is what we say. I love my job. I want to remain at my job. I certainly hope that the voters will put me back for another term, and uh, I would appreciate their, uh, uh, their trust in me. Jonas Salk, the um, inventor of the polio vaccine, once said that the um, reward for work well done is the opportunity to do more, and I certainly hope that the voters allow me that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Joe? Um, I, I have to tell you, I had chills when I, my first day on the job, I was walking into the, the state house. You know, and there I, I see the big golden dome. Sadly, uh, due to COVID, uh, there were very few times I went back because I, I actually, for two years, never had a committee meeting in the state house. I worked solely by Zoom. But if you go back and you watch a meeting of the Education and Cultural Affairs Committee, you'll see me seated at my dining room table, and behind me is a picture of my granddaughter. And uh, what I do, I do for them. That kid, your kids, and every kid I've ever worked for and with. Um, that's I, 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 I wear my emotions on my sleeve, can you guess? But, uh, <laughs> you know... It's all about doing the right thing, and I think just, you know, doing what's best for everyone. And I, I have no interest in taking credit 
I just have interest in solving problems and uh, facing issues, which I'm not afraid of. I don't run and hide. I'm out the, I'm, as I said, I'm accessible. My cell phone's number is 207-590-9902. Call it, I'll answer it. Okay, and I hope I have the answers for you. And what I don't know, I will find out. But thank you. Thank you, John. Peg? So um, you have three educators sitting at the table. I didn't say that in my introduction, but I've been teaching for 25 or 30 years now um, at college level as well, University of New Hampshire, York County Community College, and I still teach at the University of Maine uh, at Augusta as part of the work that I do. Uh, and I spend a lot of time with students talking about your civic responsibility, but not only that, the need to stay aware and alert of what's going on in the world and in your state and in your local district because things can happen and uh, reacting to change is not um, as effective as being involved in what's happening. Um, and so I feel like part of my life is about modeling that since I've spent so many years telling students they should be doing it. I feel like I need to continue to model that and I feel like I need to continue to model that for my children um, and my grandchildren. I feel very strongly that the world is in a very precarious place right now and we need to take care of um, our local state and federal uh, government and protect it and it's hard to do that if you're sitting at home. So I hope you'll give me the opportunity uh, to participate at this new level. Thank you very much. Um, that uh, wraps up our uh, questioning. Uh, I, I would like to, to say thank you to the three of you for being here tonight. It's been uh, some, you had, had some great uh, answers, and uh, certainly um, I appreciate the um, not pretending you have all the answers because I don't think anybody does. And tomorrow there'll be something new uh, coming out that'll be a new challenge. So, so thank you very, uh, very much for that. Um, yeah. I, I really appreciate you making the time, and I, I wish you uh, all the best in your uh, um, your candidacies. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Maureen for being being our timekeeper tonight, and uh, I would uh, like to uh, thank all the folks here who have had my back to uh, all evening for being here and uh, for anyone who happens to either have been viewing it or views it in the, in the, in the future online uh, for making the time to uh, listen to what's been said. I would just encourage all of the, uh, the voters, um, make sure you exercise your right to vote mm -hmm. on uh, election day, November 8th. So. Um, um, I guess I will uh, uh, leave it there and uh, say thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.